We're looking at the book of Exodus, chapter number two, 6, if you would. We've come to a turning point in this book of the Bible. Of course, many of you are familiar with this, but I'll just review real quickly. The Bible is one book with 66 books contained therein. It's uh, divided by two, and there's an Old Testament that was written before Jesus came, and the New Testament was written after Jesus went back to heaven. And, uh, but all of it is how can sinners like us be reconciled with a God who's not a sinner? He's righteous. He's holy, and we're not. And that's why the theme of the Bible is reconciliation. If you are not, if you're here today, you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven, you need to be reconciled to God. And He's waiting. He's waiting for you to be reconciled, and you need someone to take the Bible and show you how that can happen. This week, I was sitting with my friend, John, and I got to share the gospel with him in his backyard, on his picnic table, and he accepted the Lord. He texted me this morning, goes, I'm just so glad, John, that I'm saved, and I'm so glad he's saved, too. And I'm grateful for that. But you need someone to take the Bible and share because that's the theme of the Bible. The main character of the Bible is Jesus Christ. He's the one who gives us that. But every book of the Bible has the theme of Jesus. And, uh, and I think you can see him throughout the whole Bible. But the book of Esther is what we're talking about today. The book of Esther is a unique book in that the name of God is not mentioned one time in the book of Esther. Prayer is not mentioned and the Bible is not mentioned. It's interesting, probably because the people that lived in the time of Esther, uh, they were living in Persia, and they are God's people, and they had been given permission to go back to Israel, but they became very comfortable in Persia. But see, they were there because they were taken captive 70 years before, and they were 70 years in, in Persia, and then God decreed upon the heart of a, of a king to say, go back and repair your city and go back and live in your country. And he gave all of them permission to go back and to do a work for God. But it was work. It was hard. It was difficult to go back and rebuild a place that had been left desolate for 70 years. That didn't look like a lot of fun. And so a lot of people enjoyed their lucrative lifestyles and their enjoyment, their comfort zone there in, in Persia. And they just said, you know what, we're good. We'll just stay right here even though God had told them to go back to the work. And by the way, I think find, most Christians find themselves in one of two categories. People that are willing to work on a project God has for us, and that's to get people the gospel of Christ, or to live in comfort, uh, just to, to have God as, our, uh, God as our God, but not necessarily serve Him. I want to be in that other section over here, don't you? I want to be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. And uh, for as much as you know, your labor's not in vain in the Lord. But his people were there, and he really, he didn't want to put his name there. He wanted his name to be on the people that were working with him. So he didn't put his name there. But it's an interesting story. It's cast in a, in a setting of heathenism. Persia was not a Christian country. Ahasuerus was not a Christian man. You'll see that there are very negative themes of alcohol and anger and immorality. It's kind of normal in Persia. And so we see several of those themes pop up in there, but it opens up with the king of Persia, Hazarus, who has built his kingdom. When Darius passed on, he had 120 prince, uh, provinces. Now there's 127. Seven more provinces have been added to the king of Hazarus. And he has a big party. He brings his kings and his princesses, excuse me, he brings his leaders from all over the world to come and just to see his summer palace of Shushan. And they spend a half a year there, 180 days. And on the seventh day, at the end of it, he has a seven-day drunken feast for all the leaders, for the men and those ladies who came. They had a party with Queen Vashti. After seven days, they had been inebriated and drunk. They, he feels like, well, let me go get my beautiful queen and tell her to come and show off her beauty among all my drunken, drunken leaders. Well, she said, I'm not doing it. And when she didn't come, it caused a lot of turmoil. First of all, it caused anger in his heart. He was embarrassed, and it caused anger. And then he said, you know what? Uh, the other guy said, hey, man, if my wife hears about this, there's going to be some issues, man. You've got to fix this. And he quickly removed her from being queen. And he would go four years without a queen. Four years later, 
after being suggested that he gathers all the virgins. Now, he wasn't a virgin. He was an immoral man. But he wanted virgins to come from all over the, his 127 princes, and they brought a lot of folks in. But there was a man in his kingdom whose name was Mordecai. Mordecai was a Jewish man who worked in the, in, the, in the area of Shushan the palace. He wasn't in the authority at the time, but he had a beautiful cousin that he had adopted probably from birth. Most likely her mother died at her birth, and her dad died before her birth. And so he took her in and raised her as his own child. She definitely had some, some natural beauty. And she had a sweet spirit. She had learned to submit herself to Mordecai, and they were Jews living really outside of God's perfect plan. He would have rather him been back to Jerusalem, but they were there. And the book kind of tells a little bit about God's love and patience with those of us who don't always do what God wants us to do. But they were there, and whenever he started soliciting all the virgins, he enrolled his uh, cousin, Esther, into that beauty pageant and said, want you to go. And whenever she went into that thing, the, the person in charge of the whole project, really, God put favor in his heart for Esther. They spent a whole year with all the things that would make them more beautiful, more becoming, and he, they gave them seven maidens to take care of her needs. So they got all the hair products and the makeup and the jewelry and things that would make her beautiful and give her a whole year to do that. And then he would begin the process of bringing them in and evaluating whether he would take them or not as the new queen. Well, the Lord is obviously working behind the scenes. Because when it comes to Esther, not only is she favored by the, the, the chamberlain in charge of the project, she's favored when she comes to the king. The king said, oh, this is the one I want. And one of the things that made her beautiful is that she expected nothing more than was offered her. She had a contented spirit where other girls were getting a little bit like, I don't like this, I don't like this, I want to be moved from this room and all this stuff, and I don't like this girl. This girl just didn't have any complaints. She was contented in her spirit, and it made her very attractive, not only to her leadership uh, in that project, but also for the king. He loved her. He took her in. She became the king, gave everybody a day off and a celebration and reduced some taxes, all in because of the queen, Esther. However, if we could fast forward about five years, her uncle, probably through the influence of Esther, becomes a part of the leadership of Shushan, the palace in the new kingdom. Five years goes by, and there is a fellow named Haman. And uh, Haman is someone who also has got a lot of leadership, and, but he doesn't get the respect of Mordecai. Mordecai, as a Jew, had no interest in saluting him or bowing down to him when he came by, and it caused a tremendous amount of anguish inside of Haman. And Haman took extreme measures after his anger. He said, I tell you what, I'm not only going to kill him, I want to make sure I kill everybody who is associated with the Jewish people because he's known as Mordecai the Jew. And he got with his buddies, and they did a little bit of a, a little drawing of the straws or rolling of the dice called purr. And they decided that in the first month of the year, they would wait until the 12th month of the year on the 13th day, and they would get the king to agree that this people that live in our kingdom can all die on the same day. And according to the Medan Persian, he took the ring off, and when he presented with the king, he said, okay, I'll do that, and they sealed it as that was going to happen. Well, during that time, obviously, when the word got out that all the Jews are going to die on the same day, that is when Mordecai, who is now a leader in the kingdom, steps out and takes off his fancy clothes and puts on sackcloth, and, and he begins to cry and mourn and rustle his hair and put on the dirtiest of clothes. And, and it, the word gets back to his niece or to his cousin Esther and says, hey, you know, your, your, your uncle's going nuts out there. And she says, what's he doing? And why is he doing it? And she sent out clothes to him and said, please, you're embarrassing me and the whole kingdom. You don't need to do this. Put nice clothes on. He says, no, I'm not. And he informed her of all this terrible plot. He said, you need to do something about it. You didn't become a queen because of your beauty. You became a queen because God has something bigger for you to do. 
It was challenging her on that. But she said, you know, you know how it is. I can't. I haven't seen the king in 30 days, and I can't go see him. He'll have to petition me. If I go see him and he doesn't lift up his golden scepter, then I'm a dead. I'm dead as soon as I walk in his presence. And he reminds her, you, you come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And he said, okay, if that's the case, fast with me three days. I'll fast, and my maidens will fast. And you fast with the Jews and tell them to fast. And in and, uh, and, and three days, I'm going to try it. Because if I perish, I perish. He comes into the king. And the king readily offers the scepter to his queen. She walks up to him. She puts his hand, her hand on the, on the golden scepter, and, and he receives her. and says, what do you want? What do you want? Up to half of my kingdom, I'll give to you whatever you think would be good. You tell me. And she said, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you and Haman, your right-hand man, your second in command, to come visit me at my house. I have something, a banquet prepared for you. And, oh, it was a wonderful day. Haman was honored with the privilege. And the king went, and after they had got their appetizers and their, their drinks, they said, okay, now, now, what is it you want? And it's interesting, she could have come out with it right then. I said, here's what I want. You need to know this. But it wasn't time. You know, one thing as I study the book of Esther, I'm realizing is that God is a God of timing. He's put, you know, he's put eternity in our hearts, but God looks at everything in the same frame. The past, the present, the future. He knows what's going to happen five minutes from now better than you can remember what happened a minute from now, ago. He knows better what's going to happen tomorrow than we can remember what happened five minutes ago. He, he can see it all. And he's a God of timing. You'll see the words a while, now. You'll see many, uh, you're coming to the kingdom for such a, Time is this. You'll see references to time all through the book of Esther. He's challenging, and he's showing that even though his name is not there, he is there. Even though we don't see his hand in our lives, we can trust his heart. We can know that he's doing something very special. And by the way, young person, older person, man, woman, whatever you're going through, you can be assured of this. God is working in your life. You're not here by mistake. You're not here at this service. You're not here at this stage of your life. Things are not going on in your life unbeknownst to God. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurred to God? He knows. He is overruling the affairs of men. He's providential, which means that he is working everything out to his own counsel and purpose. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I was reading this morning in Psalms 22 and verse 28, and if you have that verse, Psalms 22, underline that verse in your Bible, circle that. He is the Lord of all the earth. He is the governor of all nations. He's, he's the king and he's the potentate. Well, Esther doesn't tell him right then what's going to happen. And she said, oh, he, he said, okay, what do you want? What do you want? And, and he says, well, I'm going to tell you what I want. Here is my request. And for whatever reason, we know why. God did it. He said, I'll tell you what, uh, I want you to come back tomorrow. Because something needed to happen over the next 24 hours. She didn't know. She didn't know all that was going to take place. She knew her, her nation was in peril. She was probably nervous and frightened. But they had fasted, and she no doubt sought the, the, the direction of the Lord and said, why don't you come back tomorrow, and I'll tell you. And so the king left, and Haman left. And as Haman left out with lots of glee and happiness, he saw Mordecai, and Mordecai, his disrespect, ate his lunch. And he went home and said to his wife and gathered his friends, you're not going to believe this, he said, I have got this much riches. I want to tell you about my prosperity and my possessions. Oh, and I got kids. I got 10 boys. He talked about his paternal blessings. He talked about his material blessings. And he says, look, I've been promoted by the king. My position is second to the king. And I have just walked out of a very privileged opportunity. Just me, the queen, and the king in one room. But you know what? It's nothing to me as long as I have to look into the eyeballs of Mordecai. That guy's got to go. 
And his wife and his friends said, well, you know what? You're up there. Just build a gallows. I said last week, 50 feet uh, tall. I was wrong on that. 75 feet tall and 50, 50 cubits. He said, just build a gallows. Go tomorrow morning, talk to the king, and let the king know, you, this guy's got to go. And he's disrespecting you. He won't honor you. And you, you're, you're right there. I mean, look at all the things you have. And he got excited about it. And he brought, it looks like to me, the construction guys came right away. And he spent much of the night building a, a gallows 75 feet high on his own property. Well, the next morning, he comes to the king. He's up early. He's the first, the first uh, prince to come into the courtyard. But what he did not know is that God was working. Let's look at verse number one. Can we please? We need to hasten. Verse number one, on that night, could not the king sleep? I wonder who kept him awake. And he commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles. That's like bringing the minutes of the business meeting or the deacons meeting. It's boring. It's terrible. He said, ah, go, go ahead and bring to me, because I want to get something boring so I can fall asleep. This is getting ridiculous. Tell me, go get the chronicles. Go get the minutes of all my kingdom. And they happened to get the minutes of, of, of a certain time that he, he was unfamiliar with. He didn't realize it. Look at what he says here, if you would, please. And they read before the king. So he, they're reading to him, trying to put him to sleep. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Big Than and uh, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who thought to who sought to lay hold on King Ahasuerus. So he told about the story. And it just happens to be that numbers of years ago now, back in chapter 2, two of the king's chamberlains had gotten angry with the king. And they conspired how they were going to take his life and have a coup. And it happened to be I wonder who helped that to happen. That Mordecai, the Jew, who uh, heard what happened, told the king, told Esther, said, Esther, I talked to Big Than and Teresh. They're, they're getting ready to kill the king. I think you might want to investigate that. And told, told his niece, or, and she went and told the authorities. It was investigated, found out that it was true, and they killed the man. But the king wasn't necessarily familiar with that, but he's that night, he can't sleep. And so he is reading, they're reading this, and he said, now, hey, boy, I didn't remember that. That happened, that probably happened five years prior. He said, hey, hang on a second. Yeah. So I was getting ready to die. Who helped me? They said, Mordecai helped you. He said, wow. He said, what was done for him? What, what do we do to honor him? He said, that absolutely, you did absolutely nothing. Well, I'm sure Mordecai was kind of surprised whenever he saved the king's life, and he got nothing five years prior. But now, it's five years later. And the king is in his palace and on his bed, and they're reading this to him. He said, man, what happens to that guy? Nothing. He said, that guy ought to be rewarded. Hmm. Maybe he heard a rattling of the cage. It looks like to me, not only did the king stay up all night, but probably Haman stayed up all night. Haman in a construction project in his backyard and the king listening to some boring minutes. But he heard a rattling of the case. He said, hey, who, who's, out at the, who's out at the court? They went down. They said, oh, that's Haman. Let's look, if we can, please, at verse number four. And the king said, who is in the court now? Haman. Now, this time. Haman was coming to the outward court of the king's house to speak of the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. Verse number 6, So he had come in to get permission to kill Mordecai. So Haman came in. And the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Well, now Haman thought in his what? Boy, your heart is deceitful. And boy, did it deceive Haman. Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to honor more than myself? And Haman answered, uh, the king for the man whom the king delight to honor. He said, what should you do for someone you're really are proud of and you want to honor them? And he said, well, who else would he want to honor but me? 
He said, well, here's what I think you ought to do. Verse number 8, let the royal apparel be brought to the king and use it to, to, to wear. And let the horse the king rideth upon, the crown royal which is set upon his head. So he said, bring the king's royal apparel, let him ride on the king's horse, and put the crown on his head. I think Haman had ideas of being the king himself. And let this apparel and the horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princesses that they may be arrayed the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor and bring him on a horseback through the streets of the city and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And then the king said unto Haman, make haste. <laughs> what a great idea. Do this. And take the apparel and the horse that thou hast said and do even to Mordecai the Jew. Could you imagine the swallow that Haman had on that one? Uh, the gut punch that he received with that information. He said, you're awesome. Haman, you're unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. He goes, now, do exactly what you just said. Don't let anything fail of what you said. Go do that right now for, for Mordecai the Jew. Oh, I can't imagine the face. I'm looking forward to seeing that one day in heaven cinema, aren't you? That'll be something. Then Haman, verse 11 took the apparel of the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on the horseback through the streets of the city and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate. He went back to his work after that uh, ride through the streets of the city. But Haman, he hastened to his house mourning and having his head covered. He put on his hoodie. That's what that means right there. And the Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all of his friends, everything that befallen him. They had given the idea. And then the night before, then said the king, the wise man, and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. And I think what that says in short order, Haman, you're going down. <laughs> That's what his wife said, and that's what his, his prince said. You know what? You're in trouble. You're going down. And by the way, he did go down. Look at the next part of it, if you would please. And while they were yet talking with him, notice the word while, the timing. He had no time to make a decision, to run away, to abandon, to exit the country. But while they were yet talking to them, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. This is an unbelievable story with great drama that only God could bring. But what's happening is God is doing a work behind the scene. And to, this morning, I don't have a lot to tell you, except I think there are some things going on in your heart and mind as you listen to this story. But I want you to know a couple of things, and that is God cares about you, whether you're in the will of God or out of the will of God. Now, it's much better to live in the will of God. But he loves you no matter what. He loves you. He cares about you. And if there's anything I can learn from the story of Esther, I can learn that God is very merciful to his children, even those who do not listen to him, who do not do what he wants them to do, who are not living the optimal life. Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And if you want to have an abundant life with God, you can. But if you don't want to, he's still going to do his purposes. And he's still merciful to us. And I would just encourage you, don't be a presumptuous Christian. Don't just lean upon God's mercy. Respond to God's goodness. Love him. I think number two, we need to know that God is working in the circumstances of our life and believe that. I mean, one thing that we know that, that God is pleased with, and that is faith. The most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when you think about God. Is he good? Is he right? Is he strong? Can he protect me? Can he provide for me? Does he love me? Satan, society, and our own selfishness will tell us over and over, you can't trust God. If you do this, if you give it all to God, you're going to pay. You're going to have a hard time. It's not going to be good for you. And everywhere that God puts a period, Satan puts a question mark. Every time that God, that the Spirit of God comes to you and says, you can trust me, you're going to hear, no, you can't. Well, there was no book of Esther when Mordecai and Esther were going through Esther. There was no book of Job when Job was going through Job, but there was something both places. There was a God who oversaw in the affairs of man. 
And I don't care what you're going through, whether it's being unjustly criticized or it might be some, some health issue or financial reversal or rejection you've had by your husband, your wife, maybe a disillusionment from your children. I don't know, but I'll, I'll tell you this. Know that in whatever situation you are, there is a God in heaven who oversees and he loves you. And he's worthy of your trust. He's worthy of your dependence. And we're going to find, if you read the rest of the story of Esther as we go through it this summer, you're going to see that if there's anything I learned from Esther is that God is there. And he can be trusted in your life and mine. And his eternal purposes are far more important than my personal comfort. I can trust him, and I should. And he's never been late. One thing I love about God is he's sometimes slow in my opinion, but he's never late. He's on time. I love what it says in Galatians. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. And if God knows when to send his son into this world to pay for my sin, he knows what's going on in my little life. And he is, he's working. I can trust him. You're single. You're like, when am I going to get married? My marriage is struggling. How long? I've been praying and praying for this for years. Keep praying. Keep trusting. Keep believing the God of the scriptures and the God who loves us and knows what time it is. Let's pray together.